Top 30, baby. The top third. Oh, we are getting into it now. This game's good. Snick and Mike's top 100 games. But does anyone care what they have to say? Please. I know I don't. Cause they may doubt, they may scream, they may say some things that are plain wrong. Dab on it, dab on it. But they are dumb, dumb bing bongs. My teacher's better. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murph. That's right. We are doing our 30 to 21. So we are getting into the top, top games, our Get favorite excited, games man. of all time. Really, really excited. We want to say that throughout this whole series, we've been running a Kickstarter campaign for our channel. So make sure to check that out if you like what we do. You can kick us a couple bucks. We're selling a couple games over there. Um, and so you can pick those up as well. But again, if you like what we do, thought it was in any way valuable to kick us a buck or two, we'd really appreciate it. Get you a um, Christmas card. Yeah, get you want right. some unhinged Christmas, Christmas cards? cards. Right. You should probably support it's gonna be, It's going to be real unhinged. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get into it, yeah? Let's do it. It's going to start with number 30 and hit this. Did you know that 70% of the people who watch our videos are not subscribed? Now, maybe I made that number up, but it's probably something like I think, that. I've, I think it's 100% of people. 100% of people? I think it's 100% of people. Well, don't be part of that 100%. Don't be part, be part of, of the 1% uh, and subscribe. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. All right. What is... Number 30, Mikey. Number 30 for me is a Vladimir Suki game, which I quite like, and you mentioned a list or two ago. Uh, this is Prague and Kaput Radio. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a game where you are in Prague, and you're building up the town. You are, are working on the cathedral and the hunger wall and, and yeah, uh, a bridge wall. and stuff like that, and you are taking actions based on a tile that you will uh, draft each turn. Uh, you'll choose one of the two actions shown on that tile uh, to do all those things I kind of mentioned. This is a very, uh, Vladimir Suki is kind of known for making, you know, tight resource yes. kind of games where you just don't have a ton of uh, excess yeah. and you don't have a lot of time. You have 14 turns, so you don't really have a ton of time to do stuff and you're really trying to like dial stuff in uh, and get as much as you can out of things. Uh, a couple things I really like about this game is there's this thing called the action crane where again, you take a tile and each tile will have two different actions to choose from. You'll choose one of them. And whatever spot on the action crane you took your tile from will give you a bonus. It might give you a stone or some gold, which are the resources in the game. It might uh, allow you to take a special version of a tile if you're doing like a building, uh, you know, the city tiles or whatever. You might get access to a special one. So there's like all these bonuses to, that you mm -hmm. get to kind of consider. Uh, and you are trying to kind of build up synergistic stuff because you have... The Hunger Wall, which are these tiles that you build around your player board, kind of, and you oftentimes will be rewarded with these red tokens, which are going to score based on how you do on the cathedral building, yeah. which is kind of this opposite. The cathedral tile, the city tiles that help you with the cathedral will usually give you blue tokens, which help you with the Hunger Wall. So you have to kind of build up both for them, anything to be truly valuable mm -hmm. for you, which I think is kind of interesting. You're like, okay, well... I can't just go in one direction yeah. because it probably won't yield as much as I'm hoping for. I need to kind of focus on a couple of areas and make sure that things that I'm doing over here are reinforcing other stuff that I've sort of have set into motion as well. Uh, and I really enjoy the kind of crunch factor that that provides where it's like, okay, I don't have a, you know, I have a little more stone right now, so maybe it's better for me to build a section of that wall. Mm -hmm. um, but am I going to make sure that I'm not just getting some random tile yeah. here. I need something that's going to benefit me. The tiles that you get in the game or that you build in the city will often give instant benefits uh, that help you move up certain tracks uh, or, you know, gain a little window token, which might allow you to take a second action mm -hmm. back to back. All sorts of stuff. There's just a lot of things to uh, consider. And there's just uh, many of the actions will give you these little bonuses, which give you like a little bit more to kind of think about a little bit. Maybe there's a little extra benefit and yeah. stuff like that. So it's a game that like, if you don't mind feeling under the pressure of time of like, I can't have a wasted turn because I only <laughs> sure have can. a precious few of them. Uh, this is a game that I think you well, really any enjoy. Vladimir Suki game is pretty much that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Prague is, Prague is <laughs> yeah, it's that's so the general vibe with his game. So, uh, Prague is one that we really uh, enjoy. So that's my number 30. All right. My number 30 is, uh, the highest of the South Tigris series. And this is Wayfarers oh. of the South Tigris. Last list, I talked about Scholars of the South Tigris. Sure Wayfarers is. is still my favorite. 
So if anyone's asking out there, which favorite Wayfarers is some of my favorite, um, which is the now, first right? of the three. Uh, I really, really enjoy Wayfarers. Wayfarers is kind of much more of a sandbox game as opposed to the other two, Scholars and Inventors, which are both much more linear. Wayfarers is a game where you're kind of just like, you're starting off in Baghdad and you're basically charting the lands, charting the sea, and then also charting the sky. And so uh, you are gonna be using your dice to get these cards. Again, you can get land cards, which can go out the left side of your board. C cards will go to the right side of your board. And then space cards, which will go above those cards. And the space cards are gonna have scoring on them. And then the um, land and the water cards are going to have like dice placement spots and things like that. Um, there's also a kind of cool thing where you have this like caravan on your main board where you basically are gonna have certain symbols that pertain to certain uh, dice values for you and you can add more and more symbols to those things because there are certain action cards where it's like to do this card it's like an, uh, a, say it's a land card you need to have a certain amount of boats to be able to do this action because it's like a, a sea action and stuff like that but if you use a five in that five column on your little caravan you might have the boats that you need and so it's this kind of interesting way to kind of specialized different values of your dice into certain things. It's just really, really good. There's like townsfolk we you can get, which can do a whole bunch of different stuff. They'll like tuck underneath cards and give you like extra actions or just cooler stuff. There's just a lot going on. This game is, is a tough one to teach because it's so open. There's not really any kind of like, you should maybe go in this direction. It's literally just like, just pick some stuff and do it. Like yeah. you can go, all water and never do land cards. You can do all land cards. You can do a mix. You can do a whole bunch of space cards. You can do all these different kinds of stuff. There's not really a right or wrong way. And so it can be kind of tough to get into for that reason, but it's just so fun. I just enjoy the sandbox nature of it. I enjoy every single time just being like, I'm just gonna see what happens. I'm gonna get the cards I get, see if I can make something work with it. And it just, I don't know, I really enjoy it. But that is my number 30, which is Wayfarers of South Tigers, the highest of South Tigers. Ooh. It's very good. Number 29, I would have never guessed would have been on the list, let alone this high after the first couple times that I played it. This is Too Many Bones. Wow, yeah. nice. Too Many it's Bones, many I have, I finally gave enough chances to start liking it, which I don't think you should generally do. If you don't like a game, people are like, no, you have to keep trying it. No, you don't. You do not need to. Your time <laughs> is your most valuable currency and yeah. it is not worth it to play stuff that you do not enjoy. But occasionally you can kind of break that rule. And this was this for Too Many Bones for me, where like deep down, I played it like four or five times and really disliked it every single time. And I kind of, but there's something down deep where I was like, but I want to like this game. Like there I was something want, there for yeah, you. I was like, You're I like, want to like there. it. And I kind of just kept trying it until I liked it. And now I love it. So Too Many Bones is a game where you are going to take on the role of a gear lock. All the gear locks are wildly different. They're going to have all unique dice. Um, and a whole kind of dice tech tree that you can kind of work on. They all work. And that's kind of the whole part of the game is like really learning a different gear lock, playing them. And then you're going to be going through a series of encounters, eventually trying to get to a tyrant that you're deciding to play. And the tyrant's going to be kind of like the last big fight. And you're going through the encounters. Encounters are almost always going to be battles. And uh, you're bringing out baddies. And those baddies will do a whole bunch of different stuff. And then throughout the game, you're going to be getting more and more of these dice. And you're rolling these dice and kind of trying to make it work. Um, it's really, really fun. I play this pretty much exclusively solo at this point. Like a lot of chip theory games, it kind of is driven solo. Um, and it's really fun. And what a lot, a lot of people really like in this game, and now I completely understand and totally agree, is just like, it's about learning the gear lock. Because again, the gear locks are all very, very different. And learning how to play them, what dice of theirs are better in certain situations, because again, depending on like what, maybe what tyrant you're going after, you might need to build out your character in a different way because throughout the game, you're not gonna get all of your dice. You're maybe gonna get like half of them depending on the length of the game. So it's about how you wanna build out your gear lock for this one and really learning them. And I have started to really, really enjoy learning them. It still has the kind of classic chip theory problems where there's so many edge cases where you're like, well, my character has this power, but then these baddies have this specific power. And how do these two things interact? Because that is just like never covered in the rule books. Because honestly, at this point, there's just, there's too many edge cases to really cover. The good thing is, is Too Many Bones has a really active community. Yeah. So no matter what question you have, someone has asked it on BGG and other people, uh, Shannon, who works for um, uh, Chip Theory, is very good about 
um, answering questions. So the good thing is, is it's you have a there's, resource. There's always a resource, but this is a game that's going to require a lot of googling. Because you're constantly like, how does this work with my character? Someone's asked, someone had an answer. But nonetheless, I really love it. I'm getting deeper and deeper in. At this point, I want everything. We don't have everything. We have a lot of too many bones, but not everything. I want everything. I want every single gear lock. I want everything that's ever come out for it. I really like it. Boom. Nicely done. So that's your 29? Yep. Right on. Uh, my number 29 is uh, my favorite of these games. Uh, this is Roll for the Galaxy. So... Mm. Uh, Let's go. There's obviously Race for the Galaxy, New Frontiers, uh, and more of these games. Jump which, Drive, or yeah, whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah which all hinge. Uh, they're all kind of based the, based on the action follow mechanisms from Puerto Rico, where uh, there's different phases in the game where you can explore and find new planets, develop technologies, you can uh, settle planets, you can uh, produce goods and ship those goods off and stuff like that. But not every phase that's possible, every action type is going to activate mm -hmm. unless one or more players select that phase to activate. Uh, and this one is a, a dice-based version of Race for the Galaxy, uh, where you're gonna have this whole big pool of dice, your citizenry, mm -hmm. and you're gonna shake up those dice and you're going to uh, roll them out behind your player screen and then you know, arrange them by the type of icon they have, which will pertain to that phase. Yeah. And you're gonna select one of the phases to, to activate, and then hopefully if you've rolled stuff for, you know, settling or whatever, hopefully other people have selected that phase for you so that you get to still use those dice and, yeah. do, and do fun stuff. Uh, the things I like about Roll for the Galaxy, all the games are quick because they're, they're kind of a race to the end. Yeah. Uh, Roll for the Galaxy, it's fun to get this big pool of dice. You know, a lot of the planets that you get will give you dice that you can add to your cup uh, and then you can produce... Uh, uh, resources by you know basically turning them into a die and then sending them off uh for money and things like that and you're trying to build out this tableau of planets or technologies yeah. and stuff and technologies might give you consume power so now when you're shipping stuff off you're going to get to do all of your consume powers and earn points and things that way uh and the role for the galaxy is just i just enjoy getting that cup and shaking that cup of yeah. dice out and selecting stuff and really kind of leaning into like what do i think other people are going to select like what phases are right. they going to do versus which one do I want to select and make sure happens and try to hedge your bets a little bit uh, with that. And it all kind of goes down very quickly. It's, you know, 20, 30, you know, minute game. It's not really that long because mostly you're doing stuff simultaneously. Yeah. We just kind of announce, hey, we're doing this phase right now. We're moving into this phase and now this phase. And everyone can kind of do their stuff on their own yeah. for the most part. Um, and it works well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just uh, if you like those games, Race for the Galaxy, Roll for the Galaxy, New Frontiers, uh, they're all cool, take them all, uh, but Roll for the Galaxy is my favorite. Boom, let's go. This is the moment, Nick. Oh, I, feel like, third I feel like true crossover on the list right now. I feel now. like this is going to be higher for you. But go ahead. Okay, all right. My number 28 is Crokinole. Oh, no, no, no. What? Okay. Crokinole's fine. not in my top no, five. You don't like it? It you should like be. It really you probably like should things. be, to be completely really honest. Crokinole is a dexterity game as old as dirt. Um, <laughs> old where as dirt. you have this circular board and Crokinole's you. Crokinole's my 110. Okay, fair enough. That's why I felt. I felt like it's either 28 or 110. That's I right. That is accurate. Had a sense. Uh, that was one of those. So Crokinole is a dexterity game where you have these discs and you are flicking them, hopefully into the center of the board. <laughs> Uh, that is a circular board that has a couple of these little columns around the innermost ring, which can bounce your, your disc off. And there's just basically two rules to follow. Uh, if there are only your color on the board, there's basically no opponent colors present on the board, all you have to do with your disc is get it into that inner ring. There's an inner ring in between all of those, again, like those little peg columns that are sticking up. Yeah. If you get in that inner ring, you're good. Boom. If there's at least one disc on the board of your opponent's color, you have to carry them off of one of their pieces uh, in order for your disc to stay. So if I hit, uh, you know, somewhere else and it doesn't carry them off of yours, I lose that disc. It goes off the board. Yep. If I hit other, into other of my pieces and don't hit your disc, I lose all those pieces. Yeah. Things like that. So I love the simplistic nature of I have to hit off of you. You're over there. Right. But I also want to get into the center because generally when you go to score at the end of the round, your pieces that are closer to the middle are worth more than ones out on the edges. So you have to try to knock your opponents off the board completely is yeah. ideal. Keep your pieces on. If you get into the dead center, you get to remove that piece. It's a guaranteed 20 points uh, and stuff like that. It's just so fun. It's, it's so yeah. simple. It's, it's just so good. the little flicking uh, action is is cool. There's highs and lows where you pull off an amazing shot and then just like bonk off one of the 
columns and stuff and just like get wrecked and things. <laughs> it's dead simple. It's really, really fun. Uh, it's a classic and ancient game that's been around for hundreds of years for a reason. 28 is Crokinole. All right, my number 28 is a game uh, that I would assume would be higher on Mike's list. Uh, is going to be The White Castle. Oh. Uh, the White Castle is a newer game. It came out last year, and it it we just absolutely love it. Um, this is a game by DeVere. Um, it's a very big game in a pretty small box, but this is a game that's really all about trying to absolutely maximize your turns because you only yeah. get nine of them in a game. That's it. That's it. You get three per round, nine in the whole game. That's all you get. And each round, you're going to be uh, drafting a die um, from these kind of like uh, bridges and then putting it on an action space. And then uh, you basically have to kind of like, and then the dice are three colors. And then there's going to be certain actions on that space that will match the color of the dice. And so if there might be like two black actions and one orange action. So if I uh, draft a black die, I can do those two black actions there, which is awesome. So you're basically doing that. But again, a lot of the actions are just like, get a couple of resources, that's it. You're yeah. like, cool, that was a ninth of my entire game. <laughs> that's not great. Yeah. But a lot of these actions will allow you to do one of kind of like the main actions, which will be putting your courtiers into the court, putting your gardeners in the garden, and then putting your warriors kind of out into the training fields. And there are some other actions as well, but a lot of these actions will then allow you to do a whole nother action, or at the very least, like allow you to then get some resources or do this thing or activate that thing or da 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 da. And that's kind of the crux of the game, because like I said, you only get nine turns. So the whole point is trying to have these turns where you're essentially getting to do like not just one action, but like two or three or maybe even more. Yep. And that like battle of trying to just be like, what can I do to like eke out as much as humanly possible is so much fun. And throughout the game, the actions are these cards. These are gonna be changing out throughout the game. So it's always gonna be a slightly different puzzle, which is nice uh, where you put your gardeners out. Those are gonna be like kind of actions that you can do. And you can activate them a couple times throughout the game. When you put out your warriors, there's gonna be actions you can kind of do over there. And they all kind of like work together in terms of getting you points. It's just really, really fun. It's really fun, it works really well, but it's that really tight, trying to ex just eke out as much as you much possibly as can. Possible. <laughs> and it's really, really great. And I just keep wanting to play it over and over and over again. So the White Castle is my number 28. Uh, that's it, that's 28. 27 to be higher on Mike's list, this is Kanban EV. Um, you don't know my list. I, I don't know You've your list, but I know your list. heart. I don't know where it's gonna be, but it's gonna be not 27. I, uh, true crossover? No. Okay. <laughs> 27 is Kanban EV. This is a big a Vita Lacerda game. We've been getting more and more into uh, Lacerda games. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I agree. It's my favorite of them. It's the only one on, the, on my top 100. Um, I love Kanban EV. Kanban EV is a game where you're working in a car factory, in this case, an electric car factory, hence the EV part. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's a game where you're working in different parts of the factory. You can work in the area where you're kind of like designing cars or like kind of blueprints for cars. You can go to the parts area where you're getting parts for those cars. You can then go to the assembly line where you can turn in those parts to actually make the cars. And you can go to the spot where you can actually test the cars. This is one of those games that's very, very linear, where it's like, it makes sense to make a car or to test a car or whatever, you have to have a design for that car, which makes sense. You can't make something you have to design for. Um, to build these cars, you need to have car parts. You need to go get there and turn in these car parts. Certain cars will have upgrades to them, which means all of these cars, now all the models of this car have this specific drivetrain. So when you go trying to make some of those cars, you have to make sure you have one of those drivetrain things to make sure that these cars all have it. There's all these like linear aspects of the game that's just really, really satisfying to play in ultimately a pretty big, heavy game. There's also your boss, Sandra, who's going around making sure that you are up, you're working, you know, you're up to compliance and stuff like that, doing her job, making sure you're doing everything right. So you're basically trying to get certified in these things and trained so you're not getting punished by her. Um, you have different meetings during the game where you'll basically be putting forth different ideas and scoring them. It's just a lot, but it's really, really good. And I think for like a, a lot of the big Vitala Serity games, because it's so linear, it's the easiest to kind of grok in a lot of ways. It's the easiest yeah. to kind of get into. And it's got, you know, tool art as they all do. Um, it's just absolutely beautiful. It's just so cool looking. And I don't know, there's just something about this game that just scratches a certain itch 
that works so, so well. There's really only like four main action parts and that's it, but you just can do so much with that. And every game just feels different and it's just, it's very, very, very good. And it's my 27. Nice, good pick. My number 27 is uh, La Granja, Deluxe Master Ooh. Set, was a, that's the version we have, but La Granja is the same uh, mechanically and stuff. This is a game where you're running a farm and you are slotting these cards. Uh, your farm is, is your player board. Yep. And you're slotting cards uh, along all four sides of your player board. Every card has basically four ways it can be yeah. used. Quad use. It can be used to create uh, more fields where you grow crops like uh, olives and grapes and things and grain. Uh, it can be uh, put onto the right side of your board, which might give you more income, allow you to get more cards or have more space uh, for pigs to have offspring and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You can put them under your board uh, as like, specific workers, essentially, that will give you player powers. Yep. Or you can put them on top of your uh, board, which will be certain um, contracts yep. you hope to fulfill by turning in those resources and things you produce. Uh, so that's the kind of crux of it is these cards. And you're gonna always play one per turn for sure. Uh, and you're deciding like, how do I want to use these cards? I really want this ability, but I really want to complete that contract as well. It's like, well, you're only gonna get one of those to happen. Yeah. So how do you use your cards and things? And you're hoping to, to produce resources uh, and then ultimately complete those market barrows, which are those card contracts. Yep. And there's also on the central board, different buildings that you can basically be sending resources to because you're running your farm to help supply the town with the goods they need. Uh, and you can basically fill these rows of certain types of goods and buildings to be able to unlock these uh, special bonuses and then perpetual abilities yeah. for the rest of the game as you go. This game is one that there's, you know, four uses for each of these cards. There's a lot to consider, but it's ultimately, as you get going, not super difficult to get into because the round is broken up into various phases. Yep. So you're only ever dealing with one little section of the game at a time. Yep. You're putting a card out onto your farm. You can choose to buy a roof tile. And then there's these dice that get rolled out and you're gonna draft two dice uh, that will give you special actions you can do, which will be things like gaining resources, maybe making some deliveries, uh, you know, getting the ability to do some upgrades to get upgraded resources and things like that. And then you go into the kind of delivery phase where you're gonna deliver some goods. Uh, and then you go into the end round and stuff like that generally. Um, the thing I also like is there's just kind of like an economy with this mm -hmm. game where you have your player board, which really has everything that you need. Yeah. And there aren't specific resource pieces. Like yeah, there's not like, like this little is grapes. grapes. Yeah. There's just these markers and stuff and where you place it on your board will be what that thing is. Yeah. So if it's on a card that shows the grapes, like one of those fields, it's a grape. Yeah. If you upgrade it, you can slide it over on your board to the area that holds wine because your grapes have become wine. And the fact that you can do that so you have fewer pieces yeah, around is nice. actually really nice. Yeah, it's economical, it's good. <laughs> I love how economical it is. Yeah. You know, if you have a pig and you decide to butcher that pig, it becomes some meat, easy, you know, yeah, easily easy. done. Uh, and that's kind of really nice to, to have. So um, I really enjoy just the, the puzzle of like, how do I want to build up my farm? How yeah. do I want to use these cards? Yeah. What is it gonna give me? And basically how many things can I get delivered? How much stuff can I get done with those yeah. resources that I'm producing? Because if I'm producing them, I better make sure I'm using them. You gotta hope so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to do these contracts and stuff. It's really, really fun. Um, I've enjoyed it every single time I've played it. We have the Deluxe Master set, so there's all sorts of modules in yeah, there, tons. of which we've explored only a couple. Although I've liked the ones we've explored. I love yeah. them, yeah. So I'm excited to see what other ones are yeah. in there. So uh, that's my 27 is La Granja. Number 26 is good if you like speed, baby. This is heat. Ooh, Pedal to the metal. Let's go. Uh, uh, uh. You okay. have been loving on this game. Dude, heat's so good, man. Yeah, dude. You love this game. I, I haven't played nearly as much as you. Yeah. yeah. I played a lot. So heat uh, is a racing game where you are driving around a different course and stuff. And you are managing your cards uh, and playing cards to kind of essentially manage your speed or how far you're going down the board each uh, round. You have these cards that will basically give you a five or a four or whatever. That's gonna mean, you know, that's how many spaces forward you're gonna move. Yep. And uh, each round you're gonna select what gear you're in and you can sort of shift up and down slowly from round to round. Uh, and whatever gear you're in, say I'm in third gear, that's gonna be how many cards from your hand you must play. Yep. You must play that amount of cards, uh, which is like good. If you're on a big straightaway, get it up into fourth gear and, and play your highest possible cards so you yeah. move really, really fast. 
but you're gonna come around these different turns and some turns are a little tighter than others and they're gonna require basically more or less speed for you to be moving through without spinning out. Uh, if you go through a turn, you know, that can only handle you going a maximum speed based on all the cards you play of five, and I go through at a seven, I need to pay the difference with heat from my engine. I'm basically using the engine to sort of power slow down through that turn, and I have to spend heat cards, which it must be on my player board. Yep. They can't just be in my hand. Yep. They have to be on my player board and spend those equal to the difference. So if I go through a five with seven, I need to pay two heat. If you cannot make that payment, <laughs> you're gonna spin out and basically stop right before the turn and shift down to one and take a stress card. It's yeah. not good. It's not good no, to It do. sure ain't. Uh, and then you have to start again next round. So the thing I like is that you have cards that range from like one to five or one to four, depending on modules you're playing with and stuff. But you're gonna have this range of kind of zero to five. And I could be in third gear, but I could have a zero and then two ones. And so I can stay in third gear, but only move forward two spaces. And that allows me as I come out of that turn to be already in a high gear, shift up into fourth gear on the yep. next turn and take off. So it's about managing that yeah. hand of cards. Like, do it's, I have the, the ability to stay in the high gear as possible and still make it through the turn safely? Yeah, it's really And how good. you manage that heat is really cool. The thing that really took this game next level for me is basically everything I explained was base game stuff. Yeah, that's it. But there are upgrades you can get to your car that you can draft and you will have different cards. So now our hand of cards are not the same. Yeah. Uh, and I might have something that allows me to, when I play it, I can either move forward one or three spaces. So I have a choice now, depending on where so I am in the huge. game, I might yeah. want to play the higher speed one. Or there's ones where I get to play a four, but it has the stress card symbol, which means you just play a random card out. So it's like, you're going fast, you might be going faster than you think. Yeah, <laughs> you right. Play You're a, going a lot card. faster than you think. And so it's like risk reward stuff. There's all sorts of ways to to change up the game. There's weather effects. There's kind of like tournaments you can play. Essentially, mm -hmm. there's you know upgrades you get over time. A whole bunch of stuff. It's so fun. Yeah, I love it, especially with those upgrades yeah. put on because then everyone has a different hand of cards and there's different ways to mitigate and, and maximize. It's awesome. So that's number 26 for me, Heat. I love it so much. Yeah, you really do, I love it. Uh, my number 26 is a, a macabre game called The Bloody Inn. Mm -hmm. uh, I played this uh, a couple times recently, even though we usually play yeah. it around spoopy season, uh, but we kinda, uh, I've been playing it recently. I got to show it to our friend Jimmy recently. Uh, and I love The Bloody Inn. The Bloody Inn is a, a very weird game um, <laughs> in terms of the fact that the theme it's is awesome. very odd where you are a family running an inn, kind of like an old time, like France or something like that, and you yeah. have realized that it is beneficial for you financially to kill some of your guests and Robin bury Lyons. them, as opposed to just having them stay at your inn. You don't kill everybody, just some people. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. You're um, having people come into your inn every day, people come into your inn, uh, and then you can uh, use cards to bribe guests kind of onto your side, so they'll kind of help you do all these things. You can kill a guest, you can uh, take a guest and have them essentially build an annex for you, and then you can bury killed guests underneath these different annexes. The thing about the game which is interesting is like everything is the exact same way, all the actions happen in the exact same way. Whereas like all the cards will have ranks on them from zero to three. So if you want to like bribe a level two guest, you need to turn in two cards, basically discard two cards to um, bribe those guests. And then they'll come over to you. If you want to do a three, it costs you three cards. If you want to kill a level two guest, guess what? It costs you two cards. You discard those cards and you kill that guest. If you want to build an annex and that annex is two, it costs you two cards. It works the exact same way. Same with burying a guest but there are different colors of guests. There's like blue guests. They're like kind of like your merchants, your money people. So if you use a blue guest as one of the cards to bribe somebody, you then get to keep that card in your hand because they're good at that. They're efficient at that. Um, you could get uh, like police officers are coming through and you can bribe them on your side and they're good at killing. They got guns and stuff. You can have members of the clergy who are really good at burying corpses. And then you can have kind of like crafts people who are really good at like building annexes. And all those people, when you use their cards to do that action, they're gonna come back to you, which is really, really cool. It's this tough balancing act because um, each round, every night of the inn, you only get two actions. So if you like bribe a guest and kill a guest, that guest is just sitting there until next round where you can hopefully bury them. Right. And if there's any police in the um, 
in the inn at the end of the night, if you have any unburied guests, you essentially gonna lose 10 bucks because you have to essentially get rid of the body really quickly. And you're also losing all the money you're getting from burying those guests. So all the actions work in the same way. And it's just, it's really, really good. It's again, it's a very weird theme. It's, it's just, I don't know. I really, really enjoy it. Uh, it's a really tight balancing act and it's really, really fun. Uh, and I like it a lot, it's my number 26. Number 25 was mentioned by Mike a, a while ago now, but this is Rococo. Rococo is a game where you are, um, you work at a, a fancy garment place and you are making nice dresses and lovely coats and you are dressing people in them and then sending them to the ball. And you're basically trying to get the most influence you basically want your name to be talked about the most at these balls yep. because they're like, oh, you're wearing a Mike Murphy. That's cool. Um, <laughs> That's how people talk back then. Yeah, so. hello, hello. Um, and I actually recently got to play the the new version. They made like kind of like a new deluxe version of this. Well, you're always kind of like, ah, oh, whatever. And then I play the new one. I'm like, oh, I do actually really want that new one. It's ah, very nice. nice. <laughs> it is very nice. <laughs> But it's really cool. So this is a, a deck builder game where you're getting, you have kind of your hand of, uh, of people who work there. You have like masters and journeymen and apprentice. And uh, you can basically turn in a card to do a certain action. Certain actions can only be done, like hiring new people can only be done by the master. You can't like send out your apprentice to hire new people. No. Um, but certain things that your apprentice can go get cloth and thread and silk, that's no problem, but your master can also do that as well. And then on top of that, a lot of your cards will also have something on the bottom of the card, with some kind of bonus you get for playing that card. So again, you can go and get um, different kinds of silk and then thread and lace. You could also use your cards to, again, build these garments, which you can only do with a master or a journeyman. Your apprentice isn't allowed to do that yet. And then when you built a garment, you can a garment you can then put it in the ball, or you can just sell it for money. Um, if you put it in the ball, you get to put it somewhere out in the king's, you know, kind of palace. And you basically want area control, area majority rather, in each of these different halls in the king's palace because in that room there's more Nick Murphys than anything else in there. So everyone's gonna be talking about me. Of course. You can also. Um, uh, fund like musicians and statues and stuff to put in the halls, which will give you more influence there. I'm like, oh, I brought this violinist. That's cool. Uh, you can have like a fireworks show. There's all these different things. But ultimately, the game is actually like relatively simple in terms of like, you know, it's like a medium weight game, but it's not like overly complicated. And it's just really, really good. It's just, it flows well. It's just buttery smooth. It's got a cool theme. It feels kind of different. It's just really, really great. And I like it a lot. And that's Rococo. Boom, that's your number 25. I like it. My number 25 was mentioned by you before in a different list. And this is Inventors of the South Tigris. Ooh. Uh, we're, as we've said multiple wow, times, yeah, that's cool, we're yeah. fans of Garfield games. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really loving the new trilogy. This is the newest game that will actually be coming out widely later this year. Yeah. So we're a little bit ahead of the curve. Yeah. So forgive well, us like for that. It. But uh, Adventure South Tigris is an awesome game. Uh, this is a game where you are using dice and workers uh, to activate stuff on your board, go out onto the main board and do things, and you are coming up with gizmos and stuff. You're coming up with different wild, wacky ideas yeah. where you might have like a sun-powered horse, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, other things will make sense. Or like a mechanical fan. You're like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah it's sense. probably going to be mechanical. <laughs> but there's like basically these boards, which will give you an attribute. And then these cards, which are going to be an item that you are yeah. creating. So it makes these kind of fun, uh, funny combinations. And you are taking main actions to come up with ideas, build those ideas, test those ideas, and then publish about them. So we are all working toward, uh, you know, inventing in this sort of pursuit of knowledge uh, and and kind of design uh, design stuff. What I really like about this one that I also really appreciate in the scholars of the South Tigris is the shared infrastructure of the game where I can come up with an idea. I have, you know, my, my sun-powered horse and Nick's mm -hmm. like, cool, I know how to build that thing. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to be the one that actually builds that thing. Yep. So I can have the idea, but Nick can build it, then I can test it, and someone else can publish about it. Everyone can kind of contribute to aspects of an idea and an invention uh, in different ways and trying to do things that are gonna be beneficial to them. Uh, there's all sorts of ways you can manage <laughs> all the elements in the game. There is a lot in this game. There is a ship track that you can kind of go down as you, as you uh, work your way through the game and you'll have access to these different tiles. Some of them are going to be, uh, you know, perpetual powers you have for the rest of that game. Other ones are gonna be kind of like one-time big benefits. 
uh, and things like that. So you can focus on that so that your workshop as you build it out gets kind of more and more useful. So you can use dice and stuff to take more and more types of actions. Uh, you have this uh, pool of workers, these different crafts folk, uh, that you are using to actually build these inventions and stuff like that. So you have to manage that, making sure that they're ready and they're upgraded. So you want to have as kind of high level of work as possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, if they're really high level workers, they cost more to use. They have, they're more skilled, yeah. you know? So you're trying to manage your money in that regard and make sure you upgrade all of these workers so that they become more and more skilled so that everybody kind of benefits yeah. more. Um, you're using your workers to gain resources and manage stuff and, all that and more. <laughs> there really is so much. Yeah, it's a big one. But that shared infrastructure, I talked about this when we talked about uh, Inventions, which is a different game from yeah. Vitala Serra that I talked about it many lists ago. Same idea was that shared infrastructure yeah. where we're all working semi-collaboratively you know, in this in this pursuit of knowledge. And I love that's been a theme throughout the entire South Tigris trilogy yeah. is this kind of like pursuit of knowledge as the ultimate, uh, you know, benefit. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a really cool theme. So Inventors of the South Tigris is just like super crunchy, a lot to munch on, really, really uh, fun and interesting. And there's just like a lot of paths and things yeah. to explore and try. Uh, so it keeps me coming back. This is my number 25, Inventors of the South Tigris. Number 24 is another Vladimir Suki game. I Ooh. mentioned uh, Praga just a little bit earlier in the list. This is Underwater Cities. Oh, yeah. Um, Underwater Cities is an awesome game uh, where you are uh, building out this your player board with different underwater cities. You have these like little domed cities and stuff and tunnels and things that connect them all as you are looking for basically new places to live because it's pretty populated up there on the mainland. Uh, a little bit. So we're building underneath the water here <laughs> and uh, building out. And you are going to be taking uh, action spots on the main board, kind of a worker placement, and then playing cards. So on each turn, you will choose an action and play a card. You have to play a card no matter what. And the board is kind of segmented in these three areas. There's a green area where the actions are pretty like lackluster. Mm -hmm. Uh, the red area where the actions are a little bit stronger than the orange area where the actions are really powerful yeah. and give you a lot more to do. And you also have cards that are in those three colors, but they're backwards. So the yeah. orange cards are the weakest, yep. the red cards are decent, and the green cards are really powerful. Yeah. So there is this fun thing where if you take an action in the green section, say, and I play a green card, I get to activate that card and do what it is. It might be an instant ability. It might be a card that gives you more production. You get to put out on the on your tableau. Mm -hmm. It might be a kind of, they're like these A cards, these kind of like workers that you can tap a few times throughout mm -hmm. the game, different, all sorts of different stuff. So you're trying to kind of manage that where it's like, man, you want to make a match every time because right. I want to get more out of my turn. Of course. You might not have a hand that allows you to yeah. do that. So it's like you're at times choosing actions purely for the card. Sometimes I'm like, well, I'm going to forego any sort of card power because I really need to get these specific yeah. resources or I need to build tunnels or whatever the action might be that you're hoping to do. Yeah. Um, and that kind of play, that interplay between the card abilities and the actions and the fact that they are, one is really strong, that means yes. the other one is weak, is really cool. It's really interesting. It's so fun. You're trying to build out cities, you're trying to build out productions of, you know, kelp and uh, desalinization plants uh, and laboratories and stuff. Because there's going to be three, I think, three or four key times in the game where you produce goods and you're hoping to get a whole bunch yeah. of stuff. And if you have upgraded buildings, you can start getting points along with your, you know, more resources and things. So you're trying to get this kind of engine built up so that as you produce, every time you go to produce, including the end of the game, mm -hmm. you get more and more and more stuff. Yeah. Um, it's really fun. I just love the way that you do the action selection in that game. It's so cool. Uh, there's a lot of fun things to explore. We finally got to play uh, a couple modules. We sure did. Yeah, yeah, it was really fun. Which was really fun. So that's my number 24 is Underwater Cities. My number 24 is a two-player game called Beer and Bread. Ooh, love it. Really love Beer and Bread. Beer and Bread is a two-player only game where you are two kind of like friendly rival families yeah. across a river. And every year you have a bread baking and beer brewing kind of competition where you're trying to bake the best bread and brew the best beer. And uh, you do that through these multi-use cards. So there's gonna be kind of like plentiful seasons and then kind of off like dry seasons, kind of going back and forth over like seven rounds or so. 
Um, and you're gonna be uh, drafting out these cards and you're gonna be having these cards in your hand and the cards can be used in three different ways. The very top of the cards are, can be used for a harvest action which you can basically put it down and give you those resources. It can be resources for beer and bread like rye, barley, wheat, things like that, hops, uh, water, things like that. The middle of the card is gonna be essentially a recipe for either a type of bread or a type of beer. And the bottom is gonna be usually some kind of ongoing ability or maybe some end game scoring, some extra stuff like that, that you will tuck underneath your half of the board. So it's nice, I love games with multi-use cards. Uh, this one has three different uses, this is a tough one. During the plentiful seasons, when you harvest cards, they will kind of go down into your uh, little harvest area. But then during the dry seasons, what you get to do is you basically get to pick all of those cards back up into your hand, and then you'll just draw back up to five cards, I believe is what it is. So the cool thing is, is you can kind of plan ahead where you're like, you know what, I can't build, I can't bake, bake this bread right now, but I will later. So I'm gonna harvest card knowing that I'm gonna then get it back a little bit later, which is really, really nice. And then the, during the dry season, some of the resources there are a little bit more scarce. And it's just really, really fun. And the cool thing is, is as you're baking this bread and brewing this beer, at the end of the game, whatever your lower of those two scores is, that's your score for the game. So you can't just like do nothing but beer or only bread. You have to do- You gotta balance. You gotta do a bit of both. Um, and it's a really tough balance to do because different breads and different beers have different values to them because some are like harder to make, take more resources and stuff. It's just really, really good. It goes down smooth, it's got great art, it's a fun like theme where you're just like these kind of friendly rivals, you're always having these cool competitions. I just think it's really, really great. And that's my number 24, Beer and Bread. Nice. Number 23 was mentioned by Mike on last list, I think, and this is me, the Castles of Burgundy. Yeah, dude. You know, it's like one of those things where it's like, I don't play Castle Burgundy a ton, um, but like when we're doing a list like this, I'm like, every time it comes up, um, you know, we, we rank our games with Pub Meeple, which is a kind of a comparative thing where you compare two games side of hundreds side. and hundreds and hundreds of times, and that's how you come with your list. It's really effective and really cool. And it's just, like, Castle Burgundy is one of the things where it's like, it's just so stinking good. Yep. This is a game where you have kind of like a duchy or something like that, an estate and you're rolling two dice, and those dice can kind of determine uh, the, the values that you have for this round. You can do essentially four things. You can turn in the dice to get workers, which will um, you can adjust the value of dice with. You can sell goods of the same pip value. So like if you have a five, if you have five goods, you can sell the fives. You can get, uh, there's six depots out there that are gonna have all these different tiles that you can build out your duchy. So again, if I have a three, I can grab something from the, th the three depot. Or if I have something on my board, I can put something onto a three spot. So all on your duchy, there is a bunch of different pip values. So I can use a three to put something on the three spot. But you also have to match the kind of tile it is. Because there's like animal tiles, which generally want to be in groups. You have like building tiles, which give you like special abilities. or kind of just like a one-time thing that it does. Ship tiles, which allow you to gain goods. Um, knowledge tiles, which allow you to uh, either gain like ongoing abilities or like end game scoring. A couple different kinds of tiles, you have to match that. And it's just so much fun because you're rolling the dice and you're kind of then like, okay, these are the dice I have. You can manipulate them with your workers, but you're like, okay, what do I need to do? What strategies am I going for? There's all these different boards in the game. So you can have like different duchies. You can be on the same one where you have the exact same layout or they can be like wildly different. You're trying to fill in these groups of, um, like if you have a big blob of like the, all these building spots, if you fill that all in with buildings, you're gonna get uh, a bunch of points for that. You're trying to do all these things. It's a point salad game, which basically means that you're getting points for like everything. Oh yeah. Everything gives you at least a couple points. It's just so darn good. Um, it's just, I love it. I really, really love it. I am always down to play it. I don't play it very often to be completely honest, but like when I'm really thinking about games that I absolutely adore Casper, he's obviously way, way up there. So that's my number 23. Nice. My number 23 is a game that uh, we've played a lot of over the last couple of years. That's uh, really dominated stuff. This is Ark Nova. Mm. This is a game where you're running a zoo and yep. you are choosing actions to build enclosures, play animals, uh, play these sponsorship cards, work on conservation efforts, yep. you know, build up your reputation, a whole bunch of stuff. 
uh, and you are managing two tracks where one is, is uh, you're gonna move up based on your conservation efforts. Another one's gonna be based on the appeal of your zoo. So every animal you add will usually add appeal because people like to look at that animal. That's so cool. Generally. Uh, and they will often, when you play an animal, also give you a little bit of an action, a little bit of a ability when they get played. Um, and you are trying to make sure that those two tracks pass by each other. Right. Uh, so you need to be focusing on appeal. Uh, conservation is harder to gain. Uh, but they basically, every conservation space will move you essentially three spaces forward uh, if you were looking at the appeal track. So it's a little more valuable, yeah. um, but they're harder to do. Um, you are doing these actions to kind of manage the cards that you have as you build out this kind of vast tableau in front of you. Uh, certain animal types uh, are going to require that you have played certain kinds of tags where maybe you need... Uh, other African tags, either from a sister zoo or from other yep. African animals you've played in order to play like the lion, because it's kind of like a really icon iconic animal uh, from Africa. So you need to have certain things like that, some sort of like prerequisites. As you go through the game, you can upgrade the action types. You can, uh, you know, upgrade the building. So now you can build uh, special enclosures for birds or a reptile house and things like that that you couldn't do normally. Uh, you can upgrade your sponsorships. You can play more powerful cards, uh, you know, at a lower level because when you choose to take an action, it's going to be slotted in from spaces one through five. And that's like the strength of that action. Yeah. So ideally you wait until everything's in the five slot, Hopefully, yeah. but you maybe don't have money to play out an animal right now. And so you do some other things and kind of cycle your actions down. And when you play, it goes back down to the back of the line. And so you're kind of managing the, the order of actions you take as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this game is just it's one we like. We really appreciate zoos and stuff. We really like that they're so focused on conservation yeah. now. And I like that this game is really focused on the conservation efforts yeah. as well as the appeal of your zoo. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that's really important. You need both, yeah. <laughs> you need both. It's like zoos are a great opportunity for education. And they all seem really focused on that. Education and rehabilitation. Uh, because there's a lot of animals that are in danger now um, because of us. So we need to fix it. Yeah. And uh, I like that this game kind of puts that front and center as well. So Ark Nova is just uh, really great, kind of like a modern classic. Uh, when it first hit the scene and still to this day, it is the most played game every month that we see logged out there. It is, if there's any sort of, they just had an expansion come out. If there's any sort of announcement of anything about Ark Nova, it's at the top of the hotness in terms of yeah. what game people are talking about. It's very well loved, uh, and for a good reason, I think. So that's my yep. number 23, Ark Nova. My number 22 was mentioned by Nick earlier in this list. This is the White Castle. So Ooh, um, yeah, I figured it'd be a little higher than yeah. mine, yeah. Just a bit. Yeah. Uh, really, really enjoy this game a lot. The it's ability so to pull those combos, like you said. The value of the dice uh, is important as well, because the action spots you go to will have a value of dice printed, yeah. or you can stack on top of other dice. And if I go with a lower die than what is there before, I have to pay yeah, money yeah. or I can actually earn money by, by playing a higher value die. So you're considering that. If you take a lower die from the bridge, you get to do your lantern row, which will be a, a certain cards you've kind of put the, below your board to get a bunch of stuff that way. So there's just all these fun things to consider on top of everything Nick already said. Yeah. Uh, it's just fantastic. So my number 22 is the White Castle. Nice, great game. My number 22 is a game that I think is gonna climb, um, which Ooh. is, it's not much place to climb, but it, it definitely can. I think this is Mythic Mischief. Oh, nice, I yeah. freaking, I am yeah, like yeah. obsessed with this game. So I am just, lately. yeah, I just, there's something about this game. Mythic Mischief is a chess-like game, an abstract mm -hmm. strategy game, and I do not like abstract strategy games generally, but this is one of the few ones for me. This is a game where you're kind of in like a monster high school. There's yeah. like a bunch of different factions. Monster that, Academy, you know? Yeah, exactly, like you're, you're <laughs> You're going to be playing as a different faction. You're like the werewolf faction, who are like the rockers, or like the zombie faction, who are like the hippies, you know, or whatever. There's like the gnome faction. There's like theater kids. They're all like stereotypical, like the cliques at a high school, yeah. right? You know, like, um, and so you have those, but they're all different kind of monsters, and they all work differently. Um, and basically what's happening is you are sneaking into the library at your school, and there's this big tome keeper who's going around trying to find all the kids that are in there after hours when they're not supposed to be. And what you're doing on your turn is you are spending your kind of action points to move your mythics. Everyone has three mythics. Move mythics, but then you could also um, um, move, essentially every faction is gonna have a specific way that they can move themselves and other mythics. So it might be like you get to swap you and, a, and a, a other mythic, 
or you can like push them or move them this way or that way. They all work differently. And on top of that, in this library, of course, there's bookshelves everywhere. And every mythic faction is also gonna have a specific way that they move bookshelves. You might be able to like slide it over. You might be able to like flip it over and put it behind you. You could maybe like turn a corner with it. They all work differently. And even though it's all the, only these very slight differences in terms of the way these, all these things work, they massively change up the game. And, and then basically what you're trying to do is you will do your actions and then after you do your actions, the Tome Keeper is gonna to move to pre-designated spots on the board. And if they ever go to a spot with a mythic, um, if it's an opponent's mythic, you will then gain a point. If it's your mythic, you'll lose a point. And you're trying to get to 10 points, to race to 10 points. So you're basically trying to manipulate everything. Oh, I'm gonna put this bookcase here. It's gonna cut off the Tome Keeper. So instead of coming to step on my person, they're gonna have to go around and they're gonna end up hitting one of Mike's people. So you're both just like in this like kind of like phone booth, knife fight in a phone booth, trying to move everything around, get the Tome Keeper <laughs> to go to each other. It's so good and it's so fun because like every faction, even though there's only slight differences, you also have like an ultimate ability, which is like a specific ability that only you have. Even though there's only like slight differences, they just play very, very differently. And every time you play them, you just have to like, okay, this is the werewolves. How do they go? Okay, they can shove a bookcase basically as far down in a straight line as possible. How do I use that to my advantage? And this is a game, we went out to Nashville, which is where Ivy Studios, who makes the game, is based out of, because we were there to help them promote um, this volume two of Mythic Mischief. Yep. And we had to play Mythic Mischief like, I don't know, like 12 times in like two days. And I just never, ever got tired of it. Every single time, I was just like, I'm in it. I, I'm so, I like this game so much. I've been soloing it a ton at home, yep. and I'm just playing the same faction again. I'm playing Wizards right now, trying to get them down. They're like, okay, how do I... I'm so into this game. The minis are great. The production's great because it's Ivy Studios. Next level, dude. I think this game is going to climb. I really do. That's so cool. Very cool. It's on my 22? list as well, a little yeah. lower, but I think it, it has the ability to yeah. climb as well. Completely agree. That's number 22. Let's go ahead and get number 21. All right, last of the list. This is a game that also might climb. We'll have to see. This is going to be a two-player oh. banana yellow game. <laughs> this is Iranian Burger Canal. That's funny. Yes, um, it's a good game. Man. It's a very good game. It's, it's very yellow. yellow. It's, banana, it's bananas and pajamas yellow. Yeah. Um, this is Iranian Burger Canal. It's a new of a Rosenberg game. It is one to two players. Uh, and this game is all about timing. It has no real theme. It has very little art. It is just pure mechanics. You know what And I love it. I love it, love it, love it. I would love to have, there's going to be a newer version just called Canal coming out that I think is going to have new art. Just a little spruce stuff. Which I'm, I would love because yeah. we'll be <laughs> I think that for sure. But we also But nonetheless, <laughs> we have the banana boat version. It's totally fine. It's um, dope. Love it. So this is a game where you're going to be, uh, it's an action uh, work, not I was say workplace, but kind of action selection game where uh, if you're the first player, you're gonna get to three actions in the round, and then the other player's gonna get two actions. You kind of take turn taking these action spots, which will then block them. And those spots are gonna be getting resources. There's a resource wheel, a la like Glass Road, um, a couple other, uh, or at Labora, I think, has some, a couple other Uve games, where you're basically getting resources, and you can turn those resources to move part of the wheel, which is essentially gonna give you these better resources, which in this case is gonna be brick, and then, um, what is it, steel? Uh, iron, yeah. Iron, yeah. Um, and then basically, also you can get these cards. When you get these cards, you will pay for them with those resources, and they'll go kind of into your board. But the thing is, is on the bottom of the cards, there's all these different things they can do. They're all unique. There are a lot of them, as there are many Uwe Rosenberg games. But you don't activate them yet. You activate them when they are completely surrounded by various tiles. In between all the cards, you can put various like pathways, roads, canals, or railroads. So once it's completely surrounded by stuff, it doesn't matter what it is of those four, then the card will activate. You can also build a bridge from card to, from card, to card. And once a card has two bridges attached to it, it will, um, it will activate again. Or you can do the bridge one first and then the other one second. And these cards are all gonna want certain things. Like it might be like, if this card has two roads around it, it gets to do this. If it has three or more roads around it, it gets to do this better version. It might be like, if amongst your entire board you have this many canals, you get to do this thing. They all work different, but it's all gonna be predicated on what's around that card or just on your board in general. And it kind of becomes this big timing thing. We're like, okay, I got this card. This card is gonna give me resources, give me points, do whatever. 
When do I activate it? Right. Do I do it now? Do I do it a little bit later? Should I mean, this one is better if I get more stuff around it. Should I just try and do it now and just kind of deal with the fact it's not going to be quite as effective? It's just so fun. This is a very heads down solo multiplayer solo game. The solo gameplay is exactly the same. There's not really any difference. There's a very slight difference for the action selection. So it's very multiplayer solitaire, but gosh darn, do I love it. It's just that puzzle breaks your brain. It's just so much like, okay, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I be efficient? How do I optimize this? And it's great and it's banana yellow. <laughs> it's very yellow. It's as great as it is yellow. That's true. Um, <laughs> my number 21 was mentioned, I think, last list for you. This is FAM. This is yeah. a, uh, a card play driven game where you are building up uh, structures and cities and towns and settlements and vineyards and all sorts of stuff all in the name of the Pharaoh. So the, Pharaoh. the thing that we really like about this game is that no one owns anything. If I build a settlement somewhere, it's not my settlement, it's the Pharaoh's settlement. It's, the, it's our civilization's settlement. So Nick can then go and, and upgrade that to a town or do different things or make use of that settlement to do his own stuff because maybe the Pharaoh sold you what uh, they want. And you are doing this through uh, card play. The cards you play are going to give you different types of actions you can do. And this is sort of a, we call it like a, a deck programming game instead of a deck building game because you are going to be purchasing many cards throughout yeah. the game. Uh, and those are going to have different actions, usually stronger actions and things based on the value, the number they are. The higher the number, the kind of stronger, more, more late game the card will be. And you're going to be playing these cards out. But you might run into a point eventually where you have run out of cards or you've run out of money, uh, you know, things like that, and you'll need to do an administration action. Administrative action allows you to gain some money back, remove some workers from the board, and gain some of your cards back from your discard pile. Now, as you play cards in your discard pile, you have to keep them in order yeah. because when I retrieve cards from my discard pile, the most recently played things are going to be the first ones back into my hand. So you yep. will pull them off the top of the deck at the top of the discard pile, I should say. Uh, and if I want to get more than three, I can get as many as I want, but I have to pay a dollar per card I choose to bring back to my hand. Mm -hmm. And that maybe, maybe means I have less money to then spend on my actions and things like yeah. that. So you're kind of managing all of those things. And that's something that we just really have enjoyed is the, that the nature of that, of, of having to... Uh, you know, choose how many cards do I bring back? Because if you get far enough in the game, there's going to be certain cards that are just so deep in your discard pile that they're effectively buried. Like, yeah. sure, I could spend all of my money to get these cards back, but maybe I don't want these kind of more basic cards because yeah. I have higher value cards now that hopefully do similar action types. But if it's something like building roads, if it's if I my only card is that two roads card, I might get stuck in a point where I can't build roads. I can do other stuff, but yeah. you know, you don't want to get stuck and locked out of certain actions. So this game is the strategy you do is always dictated by the cards you have, the cards you purchase from the market. There's always four cards that are available in the market. You can always see four cards that might enter the market soon, but whatever cards are available are going to be the four lowest numbered cards. And so you have a situation where it could be that the four lowest numbered cards are actually quite highly numbered, yeah. meaning they're pretty valuable and stuff, and you can get them much earlier in the game than you would expect. It all depends on how that market you know, what cards come yeah. off the deck in whatever order, which is, of course, is random. So there's a lot of interesting things where it's like, man, in this game, I was able to get these, like, vineyards built out and stuff yeah, way nuts. early, and it kind of changed the whole trajectory of my <laughs> game. And you're trying to do all these things to earn reputation because, like mm -hmm. I said, you don't own these buildings, yeah. but you own your reputation and your yes. money is yours, the money you get for working these jobs. So you're trying to do stuff uh, to get your own reputation so that people are like, wow, you really helped the Pharaoh a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's just cool. Like the the way it works is it's very kind of uh, power grid ish in that the oh, market yeah. and stuff, which is also made by Friedman Freeze, who made Fam. Uh, and there's some interest there with just those cards. So really enjoy the things you do. I love that you don't own stuff. It just feels really unique in that way. So that's my number 21, fam. Yeah. All right. And that's it, huh? That's the list. That's the list. Top 20 coming at you so Top 20 soon. coming out. It's Hot freaking me out, man. It's freaking yeah, me out. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's a big one. Top 20 is real, real cool. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, hopefully you are following along throughout this whole thing. People down in the comments, hopefully have been putting their entire top 100s uh, following it along with are. us. Love We'd it. love to see it. If you enjoy what we do, again, consider supporting our Kickstarter. We really would appreciate it. it Every dollar help. helps. Um, it, would, it makes this whole thing possible. So we really appreciate that. And yeah, let's get on to the top 20, eh? Let's get after Woo! it, everybody. We'll catch you all next time. Thank you so much for your time. Don't forget to like this video. We'll see you real soon. 
Thank you so much for watching that latest installment of our top 100. Make sure to check out the other ones over on the right side of your screen if you haven't already. Make sure to check out our Kickstarter and a big shout out to our channel sponsors, Restoration Games, Board Game Geek, and Garfield Games. Love y'all.